Hi, good afternoon. My name is Karen Rundlett and I'm a journalism director at the Knight Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us for Informed and Engaged. After the death of George Floyd and after millions of Americans protested against police brutality and systemic racism, American newsrooms began interrogating how they covered the black community. Some have hired new teams to report on the topic of race. Race is not a new topic. Top editors and news leaders have asked what stories have been missed or underreported. There is a lot of reflection happening. But what does research show about the experiences of Black adults with media, the audience? What does the Black audience think and see about news and journalism? We are going to start off by digging into the data, the research, and then we are going to talk with a panel of four great journalists. Our first guests are Priscilla Standridge, senior researcher at Gallup, and Amy Mitchell, a director at Pew Research Center. Thank you both for joining us. Let's begin with Priscilla's findings. Priscilla. Hello, thank you for having me. So I'm going to be sharing data from a study that we did in partnership with the Knight Foundation um, this past uh, year. Um, this is a study that we do every two years. It's a very large sample of over uh, 19,000 Americans. Um, and I wanna start by talking a little bit about um, this overall trend that I don't think will surprise anyone of the increasing feeling that there's a great deal or a fair amount of bias in the news coverage that people experience in this country. Um, these are trends that at Gallup, we don't really expect them to move a whole lot over time. So this upward trend in bias that people see in the news that they consume um, is really striking. It's um, increased nearly over 20 percentage points since 2007. Um, so this is really something that we see creeping into people's feelings about news in general. And we dig into that by asking people about specific areas where they might be seeing bias and being afraid of the bias that they're, that's creeping into the news coverage. Um, one area is the increasing number of news sources that report the news from a particular viewpoint. Um, and this is a big concern to people. And what's interesting here is that while around 70% of Americans overall um, see this as a major problem, we do see some interesting differences by gender and by race, especially in this area. Um, so if we look at um, the difference specifically between white men and black men, black women, this is where we see the sharpest um, difference between those perceptions. And black women are those who see this as, um, are less likely to say that this is a major problem in the news that they consume. Similarly, um, one thing that we saw this year was that Americans overall increasingly see um, a malicious and an intentionality behind the bias in news that they're consuming, which is very concerning. Um, there are a strong majority of Americans who think that the media is intentionally trying to persuade people to adopt a certain viewpoint. 80% um, of Americans feel this way. And this is something that is actually lowest among Black adults. Um, and Black adults are more likely to say that this bias is probably due to um, an, an ability to cover the news accurately and fairly um, rather than an intentionality. But what's really striking here is that one in 10 Americans really across the board actually now has begun to say that um, the news is intentionally trying to ruin our country. Um, and this holds pretty constant across all of these groups. One area where Black adults have a more positive view of uh, the news is around the idea that the news actually carries the blame for the political divisions in our country. Um, there's this idea of sort of a chicken and egg scenario where the news is feeding the bias or vice versa. Um, and we see that among Black adults, um, we see the least amount of responsibility attributed to the news media specifically in um, creating political divisions in this country. Um, and not surprisingly, um, we see an also um, a smaller degree of Black adults that feel that the media can actually heal these political divisions. What's interesting here is that Americans overall think that while the media is responsible, it could also fix these problems. Um, so probably the lower percentage of Black adults that feel this way is because they actually see less blame to begin with in terms of the media's role in this specific issue. This year, we also asked quite a bit about um, how people felt about diversity in news. Um, of course, this has been a conversation for a very long time, and it's, it's definitely a concern that's come to the forefront 
um, especially recently. Um, and we asked Americans whether or not they thought that representing diversity in the U.S. was a critical goal for the news media. Here we're looking at, you know, what is the responsibility of the media in specific areas in society? And we see a, a strong percentage of Americans overall who do think that this is a critical goal for the news media. But really, there's a strong percentage of Black adults who feel this way, that it's critical or very important for the media to reflect diversity in the US compared to um, white adults where that percentage is, is significantly smaller. And in, in addition, we also asked about the responsibility that news organizations have to hire um, reporters from diverse backgrounds. Um, this was another interesting question that we asked people and Americans overall, you know, a strong 80% really feel that this is something that uh, news organizations in general should do. Uh, and this feeling is higher uh, among black adults in particular, as well as Asian adults in our country, um, just slightly lower among Latino and white populations. But what's interesting here is that when we dug into specifically the areas where news organizations needed to hire more diversity and ask people, what kind of diversity are you actually thinking about? We really start to see those divides and those um, perceptions start to diverge. Um, we asked about a variety of different types of diversity from race and ethnicity to political views, income and social status, as well as age. Um, and Americans overall definitely see that race and race and ethnicity and political views are the two chief areas where there should be greater diversity. Um, but among black Americans, there's 60% of them that say that race and ethnicity should be the, the, the main area where we need more diverse staff. Um, and among Republicans, um, there's a there's a much stronger view that um, political views should be the diversity that is more represented in the news media. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Amy Mitchell from the Pew Research Center, um, and I think that she has some more steps to give to this conversation as well. Thanks so much, Priscilla, and I will, if you turn off your screen, I can share mine. And um, I'm going to build off of um, some of what Priscilla was speaking about. We certainly have seen um, a number of the same, similar types of findings in terms of, um, of black adults in the US generally being more positive about the news media um, compared with white adults in particular, expressing greater interest specifically in local news and tending to be um, larger followers of um, uh, local television specifically. So I'm going to um, sort of build off where Priscilla was and share a little bit more of our data that comes from a range of different studies on um, both the specific topic areas and areas of news that Black Americans in particular express higher levels of interest in, and then some of what they're looking for in the news media and the sources that they turn to. So this is a, um, asking about sort of the, how big of a problem different issues and issue areas are in the country. And you can see here, the one that's highlighted is one that had to do with um, the particular study at the time that was around made up news and information. But you see the ranking here much higher among white adults than among blacks or Hispanics. Drug addiction tends to be high across the board. Um, but then you start to get to a lot of areas of difference with racism and violent crime, gap between rich and poor, much higher among the black adult um, population in the U.S. compared with the whites, still high among Hispanic adults, um, but in some cases not as high. And even if you look here in something like the gap between the rich and the poor, it's 70 percent of black adults who are saying it's a very big problem compared with 45 percent of white adults. So even though their ranking is similar, the portions there are still particularly different. So if we look at the um, protests, um, which certainly have been you know, a major part of the news agenda and the narrative um, of what's happening in our country today. This was a, a survey that was asked in um, the early part of June, just to put it in context, but you can see here, you know, even though it's been, been followed quite closely, by US adults overall, much higher portion of black adults that have said that they're following this storyline in particular very closely. And then we also ask about how the news, news organizations are doing covering it and about the messaging that Donald Trump has been delivering in response to the protests following the death of George Floyd. And again, you see here also 
very um, you know, large differences with the black adults in particular giving higher ratings to the news media for how they're doing, covering these, um, the protests following the death of George Floyd, and more negative marks to the response that Donald Trump has been giving as well. When we ask about sort of different storylines within the protest, whether they've been getting the right amount of attention, too much, too little coverage in the news, you also see differences between black adults and white adults here as well, with um, two of the larger areas of difference in the amount of coverage being given to the decision of whether to prosecute officers involved in George Floyd's death. And again, this was asked, this was a survey from June 4 to 10, so that's the context of the timing of the story at that point. Um, uh, and then also more black adults saying too little coverage has been given to the larger issue of race relations surrounding the protests. Some areas where there is general agreement um, as well. Uh, and then if we think about one of the other big storylines um, that's been with us for now quite some time, the COVID-19 outbreak in the US, we also see here that black adults tend to be discussing it almost all the time um, with others um, uh, to a greater degree than Hispanic adults or white adults. And then we ask here both at the national level and the local level, uh, the degree to which people are following, again, different storylines within the coronavirus outbreak uh, very closely. And you can see at the national level, this first question, the health impact on people like me, a 19 percentage point difference between the portion of Blacks, 55% Black adults who say they're following this news very closely, compared with 36% of white adults and Hispanic adults fall, falling in the middle. The 16 point gap um, between very closely following the availability of US hospitals to treat people, the number of cases and deaths in the US as well. And when we ask about local storylines, Again, you see the availability of testing being a very high difference between black adults and white adults in the US, 23 percentage point difference. And this was, um, we've asked, we've done a number of different studies around the outbreak, and this was one that was late April. So it was at a time period where the availability of tests was a, you know, a, a, a question. Um, and also the status of nearby hospitals in the local area, 23 percentage point difference, 21 percentage point difference in the availability of unemployment and other types of aid, 20% to 41%. So quite striking differences in the storylines that black adults compared with white adults in particular are following very closely. And then just um, also, we'll, we'll pivot to, uh, to look a little bit about what black Americans say they're looking for in specifically, excuse me, in their news sources. And if you look at um, the US population overall, Americans overall see journalists' demeanor, that sense of them seeing friendly and warm, as most important in choosing news outlets. So this side here with the dark is the very important, somewhat important. And if you look at these then by race and ethnicity, you can see again, significant gaps here um, with Hispanic adults often in the middle, although sometimes align much more closely with black adults in the US. But the question of, oops, excuse me, the question of um, the fact that they cover people like me, much more important here among black adults than among white adults specifically, 68% to 41%. And again, you see this question of journalists seeming friendly and warm, much higher among black adults in the US compared with white adults, not quite as big of a gap here. And then sharing my views also becomes important as well. Um, and again, if we look at sort of how people feel about news organizations, a majority of Americans overall say news organizations don't understand them. But then we followed up with that and said, what don't they understand about you? And here's where you see these differences with the largest segments of whites talking, white adults talking about political views is what they don't understand about me. Whereas among black adults, the largest segment says personal characteristics. And Hispanic adults are, um, have a little bit more of an even sort of spacing across a, a number of different factors. And then finally, I'll just end with a slide that looks at the industry itself and the employment. And you can see here that this is comparing newsroom employees in these numbers to the US workers overall. So newsroom employees compared with employees overall. 
And you do see that newsroom employees are less likely to be um, non-Hispanic white. Um, I mean, or sorry, are more likely to be non-Hispanic white here at 76%, less likely to be non-Hispanic black or Hispanic. Um, and these are data that are coming from a, a five-year five census um, block that went up through 2017. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Karen, and um, I think we'll have some conversation. Thank you. Oh, Karen, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Amy. And thank you, Priscilla. Um, we, uh, that's really going to inform our conversation. A lot of important uh, themes to pull out of that. Um, I do want to introduce our four panelists. We have four great journalists with us. OK, um, we'll start by introducing Dorothy Tucker. She is the president of the National Association of Black Journalists and also a longtime television investigative reporter at the local CBS station in Chicago. Then we have Topher Sanders. He is a race and justice reporter at ProPublica. He is also one of the founders of the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigative Reporters. We have Karen Hawkins. She is the co-editor-in-chief of a publication called Chicago Reader and Jawan Strader. He is the main news anchor at the Miami NBC station and he also hosts a program called Black Voices. Thank you all of all of you for, for joining us today. I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Um, so there are definitely journalists watching but there are also this is a an audience of, of lots of different kind, kinds of folks. So I just want to start, let's just get some terminology straight. Okay, show of hands if you describe yourself as a journalist. Show of hands. Show of hands if you describe yourself as a member of the media. Okay, all right. Um, Jawan, would you, you're the one who's raising your hand. So let's talk about that. Um, what is, what's the difference between those two terms for you, Joanne? Well, me personally, I don't see uh, a big, huge difference. Um, but I, I will say being a journalist is what's most important to me than anything. Um, as, as I always try to teach and, and, and educate uh, young journalists coming into this business, it's important to be a journalist first more so than anything else when it comes to this business. So the media, of course, to me, falls under everything else. It's just, uh, it, to me personally, it could be something that uh, it's almost like an umbrella that you could be thrown into. Uh, but most importantly, when it comes to fact finding, when it comes to explaining, when it comes to sources and getting your information correct, to me, it's about being the best journalist that I can be. Thanks. Okay, Karen, you, uh, I saw a little smile from you. So I just want to know what those two terms mean to you. Sure. And I didn't raise my hand because I feel like when yes, people, when I, I, when I hear the term media, I think mainstream media, obviously, and I work in alternative media and um, have worked in alternative media for a long time. I've also worked in mainstream media. And I feel like I have made a very conscious choice in my career to work in media that disrupts the mainstream media ideas and the notions that that mainstream media practices. So that's why I didn't raise my hand, but I absolutely identify as a journalist. Um, it's something I've been trained to do and that I take really seriously. Thank you. Uh, Karen, I want to talk a little bit about Chicago Reader. Um, Chicago Reader is um, co-owned by an African-American. Um, you are a co-editor. Um, and you, and the board, the board of the organization is 50% African American as well. What does that composition, what is the goal of that composition to serve community? How does that affect how you serve community at Chicago Reader? Sure. I do think it was a very intentional move by the reader um, to better represent Chicago. 
the Chicago Reader was founded in 1971. We got new owners two years ago. And I feel like as we were going into this next stage into middle age, we were really looking to better represent what the entire city of Chicago looks like. We have always covered the city of Chicago, but not always well. And everybody can guess what communities those are that we have not covered well. So this bringing in of different ownership, this bringing in of different leadership was really an effort to do better by everyone in Chicago. Thank you. Um, a, a lot of a lot of themes, a lot of data coming out of the presentation. You know, very much. Um, there, Americans are seeing more bias in the news, um, and um, there, the news has accelerated. It is infinite and it is immediate. It is coming at us on our phones. It is coming at us in social media. Um, there are twenty-four hour um, news cycles. Um, um, but the black community um, is saying that diversity is important to it. And when they talk about, and when the black community talks about um, diversity, they're talking about race and ethnicity. Whereas it, we specifically um, had numbers about white and Republican audiences talking about diversity of politic, political ideology. Um, Dorothy, I'd like to ask you as the president of the National Association of Black Journalists, um, there's been a, a lot of agony and anger and criticism um, about what news organizations have really done to serve black audiences. And it's come not just from the outside, but from the inside. How is the National Association of, of Black Journalists, NABJ, responding to that? We are seeing a reckoning in the newsrooms, just as we are in every other industry in and in this country. You know, so um, on a national level, we are definitely joining everybody on, on, on a local level. Uh, I mean, what's going on in the newsrooms it is, in, in some cases, is almost a, a little bit of an, an uprising. And it's, you know, quite frankly, it's about time because, uh, you know, for so long, uh, black journalists have been waiting for their turn. You know, they they have suffered through uh, unequal pay, um, a, a, a lack of um, mentorships. You know, they haven't had opportunities for those prime assignments. Uh, you don't see them covering, uh, or as many as we would like to see, covering politics. Uh, they aren't in the investigative units. Uh, you know, so there, there are a lot of issues there, which is why I think, you know, you're, you're seeing this kind of uprising again within the newsroom. So we are uh, talking to many CEOs and, and publishers and top leaders and owners of newspapers and the, or, or media companies, because now it's not just print, it's digital, it's their television, it's everything. You know, I probably have two or three meetings a week sometime uh, early in the mornings before I start my day. Mm -hmm. uh, yet another CEO uh, discussing with them what they are doing in their newsrooms, not just talking about diversity, but also talking about the culture of the newsroom, you know, pushing for more black managers and finding things that quite honestly are very disheartening. You know, when I speak to some of the, some of the managers who are in major markets and they have either just one black manager or they have, or they have no black managers uh, and, and they wonder why there was something stupid that ended up on television or ended up <laughs> on the newspaper or on the website. You know, there was, I'm like, so where was the black person at the table? Well, there was not, you know, so it's, it's, um, we're having lots of, of conversations, meaningful conversations, but the thing that probably frustrates me, and I will shut up in a minute, but the thing that frustrates me more than anything is that many of these uh, managers, they come out with these statements that say, you know, we support Black lives, you know, uh, we support you know, Black Lives Matter. They come out and they they support diversity, they support inclusion, but yet and still, when we ask them uh, to publicize their numbers on diversity, they're silenced. You know, they don't want to do that, and it's very difficult for us to measure success if we don't have 
the data. And that's what we're asking for now. We, will, we need these uh, managers to really, you know, put their money where their mouths is and not just talk about how important this is, but to allow us to help them. But to do that, we need to measure success. We need the numbers. We need them to publish the diversity numbers because our concern is that, you know, maybe they don't look that good. And so. Well, thank you, Dorothy. Um, I, um, they're not good enough. Um, we certainly have numbers from the Radio, Television, Digital News Association. Um, and we certainly have uh, numbers from the, the, the uh, NLA. Um, um, and um, they don't align with what the populations are. It's not about specific organizations, but um, it, it does not align with um, what the populations are. Um, Topher, something that Dorothy um, just brought up, and she's an investigative reporter herself. So um, you founded the Ida Bell Be Well Society. What is that and why is it necessary? Yeah, um, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, and, and thanks for everybody being here. This is a really important conversation. Uh, Ida B. Well Society for Investigative Reporting is a nonprofit that's looking to do um, kind of exactly what Dorothy's, you know, challenging everybody to pay attention to is uh, increase the numbers of uh, black and brown people who have opportunity to do investigative work, uh, both as reporters and as editors. So uh, Topher, um, like, why is that even a thing? Aren't there just black reporters working? Like, why? what's the big deal about becoming an investigative reporter? Sure, so uh, investigative reporting is um, at many organizations is the is the work that they uh, pour a ton of resources in and that they allow their reporters uh, many weeks and months to develop and uh, to pour over and make sure it's uh, it's pristine and that it's also targeting important issues in the community. And so when those are kind of your your gold standard uh, reporting teams within an organization and they lack diversity, what types of projects will they pursue? What type of, of things will they find important to pour those resources in? And you know, it's a no-brainer um, when you have uh, diverse thoughts and perspectives on those teams, it shows up in the work and it, and it starts to show up in the community because oftentimes uh, the work generated from our investigative teams and investigative reporting has real impact in our community. And so when you diversify those spaces, you can really start to see those impacts happening right there where you live. So Topher, you did um, a series of reports. It was called Walking While Black. Um, that, is, um, that was a large project. Talk to us a little bit about how long it takes to kind of lift that so it does get published. I mean, it doesn't happen in a day. Right. Yeah, uh, Walking One Black, we reported on over a period of about seven months, um, about five or so of those months before the first story published. And uh, the way a story like that begins, you know, uh, ProPublica is kind of a special place where its entire mission is, is devoted around uh, deep dive investigative work. Uh, but in, even there, uh, you still have to uh, push and find ways to get certain uh, things out there. So with Walking While Black, it was never really intended to be uh, the project that it, uh, that it turned out to be. Uh, the editor originally was, um, when I brought the concept to the editor, the editor said, hey, uh, take a few weeks on this and you know, let's turn in something quick. Uh, there's this other big thing I, I want you to do. And uh, a couple of weeks turned into five months. And to that editor's credit, that's how the conversation began, but as I began to present more and more material about what we were finding as me and my co-writer, Ben Konark, were doing our reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, the editor began to see the vision uh, that me and Ben saw in the very beginning and uh, Walking While Black eventually became what it became. Thank you. Um, Jawan, I wanna to turn to you now. Um, you are the main anchor, but you also host a program called Black Voices and um, I'd like you to talk to us a little bit about how a program like that comes about and what 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 it kind of takes to make make that um, make that happen and keep going. 
Well, first and foremost, again, I want to thank the Knight Foundation. I want to thank you, Karen, um, as well as your colleagues for this important conversation. Um, I believe that education is the key to success, no matter where you're from, no matter what level, how old you are. This is important, something all of us can take from this conversation. Uh, Voices uh, basically has been around for two and a half years now with NBC. I give them credit for allowing me to use this platform in order to educate and better our community. Uh, we found out that, and I have been telling them for years that I've been at the station, that we need more representation on the air when it comes to us and our community. Um, it's the main reason I got in this business in the first place, because I got tired of not seeing enough faces and people that did not look like me. And I got tired of seeing so many people that were not as educated, say, that they were putting on a screen making us look a certain way. And so I knew that there were other voices out there. And so now I have that platform. So we've done stories breathing while Black. This was last year before George Floyd, when we had voices from the community talking about some of the issues going on in the Black community, where it came to driving while Black, walking while Black, swimming while Black. And sure enough, George Floyd happens. And then we have another Breathing While Black town hall. We've talked about um, prison reform, um, uh, Black entrepreneurship, Black uh, uh, Afro-Latino conversations, Black hair, uh, you know, Black youth attempting suicide. So every week that we have the show, we want to make sure it's a it's a time and a way for people that we do not hear from every day, which is why it's called Voices. They get a chance to talk about some of these issues that are impacting the Black community. And there are so many issues. It's not just one thing, so many issues. And it gives our viewers a chance to see people and hear from people that look just like them, which is extremely important. Thank you. Um, Karen, I, I want to go back to you. I want to hear from you a little bit more about, um, we had talked early about ethnic and Black, um, Black publications and news outlet partnering with commercial, larger commercial properties. Um, what, how would that look and, and what might larger commercial properties learn from an organization like Chicago Reader? Thank you so much for that question because it's a project that I love talking about that I love that we are working on. So the Chicago Reader has created the Chicago Independent Media Alliance and we are nearly 70 outlets from the community and ethnic media all coming together working on fundraising projects, working on editorial projects. And what I find one of the things that I find interesting about being in SEMA, we call it SEMA at this point in time, is that I'm also watching larger legacy mainstream organizations having all these conversations about pipeline and how do we diversify and how do we reach hard to reach communities and neighborhoods and the community and ethnic press is made up of people of color and are reaching all these communities y'all are trying to reach and have been doing it in some cases for a century and i think there is a ton of course that the community and ethnic media can learn from mainstream press and we would love to have access to your resources but there's a ton that you can learn from us and i think um at least when I was coming up in journalism, there was this notion that you worked in community and ethnic media as a jumping off point so that you could get the bigger job at the bigger platform and that people kind of turn their nose up at those jobs. And now I hope we're in a place, both because of the economy and because of where we are as a culture, that people see this as a place where you spend your career. Not everybody wants a big mainstream media job. Not everybody wants to work in a newsroom where no one looks like them. And so I, I am hoping that we have more of these conversations now that SEMA is coming together, that we have more of these conversations with our colleagues in larger media outlets. Thank you. Um, Dorothy, you have been in Chicago, um, which is your hometown, for a number of years. I know you're wearing your NABJ hat, but I want to talk to you about um, how, I want to hear from you on how you have um, engaged with the community over that time and how it's changed. What are you doing today with community? How, how has your role changed? Well, I, I don't know that uh, my engagement has changed uh, mm -hmm. drastically. You know, I mean, because I am now 
fully an investigative reporter. I am not out on the street covering stories on a daily basis like I used to. So it has changed in, you know, in, in that regard. Um, but, um, you know, I, I make a point and I always have, I mean, not, you know, not just because I'm from Chicago, but, you know, I make a point of attending various events um, be, as a Chicagoan, you know, I happen to be mm -hmm. a journalist when I go, but, you know, if, if, if there is a fair going on, if, if, if there is a church event, you know, I mean, I, I go and I do that. And I know that that really allows people who see me to say, oh, wait a minute, I have this story. Let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about the other thing. So that, you know, I, I engage in person. Obviously, I engage like so many of us do uh, on, on social media. Um, but the, the one thing that I will say is that what I have found in, in your, the stats that you guys lay out, very interesting, uh, local reporters, you know, I think we, we have, we are not seen, uh, we are more trusted than I think those on the national level, you know, so uh, people turn to us and they do expect us to, to represent them. You know, they do expect us to, uh, to be truthful. So, you know, we, there's a lot riding on our shoulders, uh, you know, in that sense. So there, you know, there, there's, there's an obligation. You were going to do it anyway, but, you know, there's, there's a little bit more weight when you do a story, especially when you do a story that uh, is that slice of life about the Black community or, or that, you know, really focuses on something uh, some systemic racism that's happening in the black community. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that answered your question because I wasn't quite sure where to go, but the follow up. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you also, um, this, this report, um, specifically what Amy Mitchell from Pew um, spoke about the trust and, uh, and also frankly that more black adults are choosing television as one of their sources. Um, so at the local level, if there's if if there's this viewpoint that there is more bias in the news and local is more trusted, what is local doing well? What do you see local doing well? You know, I mean, I I think uh, I think local is covering the neighborhoods. Uh, you know, I think I think local is really out uh, in the community. You know, uh, you know, we when we talk about the COVID stories or we talk about the protest stories, you know, the, the local reporters are, because we're connected, you know, we're the ones that are telling the story of um, that, that, that part of the community that is overlooked because we know them, because they called us, uh, you know, so that when you talk about even, uh, you know, the COVID related stories, you know, we can really get in there uh, and, and, reveal different things and uh, about the history of a neighborhood, for example. You know, so when we talk about something like, uh, you know, you, you talk about the number of, um, the dis disproportionate number of African-Americans who are dying, you know, we can then look at that story and, and break it all the way down to the neighborhoods. We can, we can talk about the, the stores, the grocery, the, the, gro the desert, you know, the grocery desert that exists and where those stores are. And so, I, I think what we do well is just really, you know, dive in a little deeper on the neighborhoods because we know Karen, the neighborhoods. Yeah. Karen Hawkins, I see you kind of nodding. Did you want to chime in on that? Yeah, you know, I'll just add, um, and I just want to say what an honor it is to be on a panel with Dorothy. Uh, thank you. But um, <laughs> I, I'm trying not to fangirl. But it's, I, okay. I also grew up in Chicago. So, um, you know, what is what are local media outlets doing, right? I also, I feel like we are engaging it with audiences in a completely different way. And like Dorothy said, we're in neighborhoods, we're reporting on neighborhoods. And if you're a Black journalist and your outlet does something that people don't like, they're going to let you know. Like, I feel like another thing that news organizations are spending all this money on is gathering data from readers and from viewers. We want to know what you think. We want to engage with you. We want to have conversations. And I feel like I have conversations with people all the time. Um, so it's not that people have a, a dearth of opinions. I feel like another thing that we're doing right is that we are closer to our readers and that it is more of a, it is already more of a conversation than other media outlets might have. But, you know, let me, let me, I saw a question here that I just have to respond to. Somebody said, they're not, they're not with the media and what can they do, uh, you know, to help, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're just, 
somebody uh, who, a viewer. And is that then, on the chat? Is that on the chat? That was on the chat, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, you know, yeah, that's uh, Liana Gwynn. Yeah, what can ordinary yeah. members of the community, those of us who are not CEOs and managers, do to support the work of our black brothers and sisters? What power does the everyday community have to affect these issues? And to Karen's point about that engagement, uh, you can complain and you can compliment, you know, and that really makes a huge difference. If you see something on television, if you see something, um, you know, on, on, online uh, and, and you don't like it if, it, if it disturbs you, don't, in addition to social media, you know, still do the old fashioned way, write the letter, send an email, make a phone call, and then ask all your friends who probably are chatting about it at the barbershop, you know, if you don't like it, say something and let management know that that was offensive. You know, at the same time, if that story really finally strikes a chord, if you haven't seen that story anywhere else and you really appreciate what that reporter did, what that reporter wrote, then compliment them so that management will sit back and go, oh, so that one resonated. Let mm -hmm. me make another story like that, you know? Oh, that was offensive. Let me make sure we don't do that again. So that, I mean, the power of the public is huge and we still need the public to support us. Thank you, that's, that's incredible. Um, I, I, and Dorothy, also thank you for reminding me to get to the questions um, from the audience. Um, there is a question here. Um, we have spent a lot of time looking at the data around the idea of bias and um, there, to be honest, there has been a, a robust dis discussion about uh, amongst journalists about what does objectivity mean? And there's a question here, um, how do you handle pressure to fit in with established news values? Um, what tactics do you use when you are told an idea is not newsworthy? I'd like to put that one to Topher. Topher, would you talk about that a little bit? It's from Jocelyn Ford. Yeah, I wanna make sure uh, the top of that question was about Oh, can you repeat the top of the question? Sure. How do you handle pressure to fit in with established news values? Hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know that I have uh, that pressure. Uh, I don't know that I feel that pressure. Uh, I don't think I've felt that pressure at any place I've been. I feel like I, when I came into journalism, I had pretty strong feelings about what was newsworthy, what was, you know, ethical. And I don't see that being different at any of the organizations that I've worked at. So I haven't had a pressure to necessarily fit in. I don't know if maybe that is about like story selection and the stories that you want to cover. Uh, there, there's some, there's elements there that we could speak about. Um, and I don't know if I've had pressure more than uh, just uphill fights and battles to kind of cover the kind of stories I want. So I don't know if that's uh, answering that. Uh, you got to go deeper there. You got to go deeper on that. That was, that was, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, um, no, it's, uh, uh, it's everything from, you know, when Trayvon Martin was killed in, uh, in, in Florida and trying to uh, advocate for coverage from the news organization I was at when I was in Florida, that that was an important story and that we needed to cover that story and we needed to be present in that story. And, and all you can do when you're a reporter, particularly if you're a junior reporter, which I was at the time, is all you can do is make the arguments and, and fight for it. And in that instance, uh, I happened to be pulling a, a cop shift. I don't know if anybody knows what that is anymore. <laughs> uh, but when you work at a newspaper, you pull the short straw or you work at a television station, you may have to man the scanner for a weekend or whatever. And I had to man the scanner uh, one weekend to cover cops. It happened to be like maybe the second big rally that they were having uh, in the community where Trayvon was killed. And, and what it looks like for me is saying, that's what I'm gonna use my cop shit for. I'm gonna drive two hours down the street and I'm gonna cover this rally because this is an important story and this is what I wanna do. And I'll come back if there's something major happens, but if not, I'm not gonna cover the bar mitzvah that weekend. This weekend, I'm gonna go cover Trayvon Martin's rally. And so I, you know, um, I think it's a uh, subtle uh, moves like that that you can make in a newsroom, trying to see where you can fit in and how you can push for those stories to get out there and be important. Um, we want you to keep your jobs. We want you to stay employed. So don't be too rebellious, but be as rebellious as you feel you can be to get that coverage out there. 
Thank you. Um, Jawan, you are in Miami. Um, so I, I'd love for you to reflect on what coverage around uh, Trayvon Martin looked like as opposed to the coverage of today and how the movement has changed and the kinds of questions that the newsrooms are asking as they cover this. Well, it's changed a lot. Now we have their ear more so than we had before uh, since George Floyd, but we should have had their, their ears years ago when it comes to editors and managers in the newsroom. Because again, as Dorothy said, and as your research has shown, it does not reflect us, our newsrooms. And so now we're trying to change that. So let me do one better. And Sabrina Fulton is actually a friend of mine um, and, and a good, good friend of mine, actually, Trayvon Mar uh, Martin's mother. But uh, I'm gonna do one better um, and, and actually devastating. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the church shooting in South Carolina where nine okay. members were killed by a white supremacist. So that's in South Carolina, that is not in Miami. So when that happened and I woke up that morning and I found out about what happened, I felt compelled to go to my manager who's an Hispanic woman and tell her, I'm in, we're in Miami, but I, you have to send me to South Carolina to cover this story. And she, she's, I'm like, listen, I have to go. This represents all of us. This does not just rep represent South Carolina. And so she said, hold on just a minute. I'll get back to you. Talk to the GM. She said, pack your bags. You're on a flight. You're going to South Carolina. Now, let me tell you this. Our rating leading into that newscast was the worst it could be. It was like a .001. That newscast, because we pushed that we were going to South Carolina and let our viewers in Mount Miami know in South Florida jumped almost triple that night because of our coverage. I filled wow. anchor from South Carolina talking about this mass shooting by white supremacists and that what we were starting to see and we've been seeing, but just mm -hmm. on this type of scale in our country. But you have to push, as Topher said, you have to do it in a way though, where we don't come across as the angry black man or the angry black woman. There is a way to do it without coming across a certain way. Now, if they would have said no, <laughs> I may have turned into that angry black man, but, um, but they didn't. But you have to be willing to take a risk. Okay, I heard angry black man, and I see Dorothy, she's, she's dying to jump in. <laughs> Are black journalists biased? Are black journalists biased? Let's, let's, I need you to, I need somebody to tell me. Are they biased? Because there, there's that, Assumption, Dorothy? No, black journalists are biased. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, we come to the table with who we are, with all of our experiences, but, you know, I mean, it, it, that's an unfair question. And it really upsets me when anybody even raises that question because you don't ask white journalists, are they biased? You know, black journalists are the only ones that are ever asked, are you, are you biased? Can you be fair? No, mm -hmm. professional. We do our jobs. Mm -hmm. Thank I mean, you. We can cover any story and we can look at every angle there is in that story. And even if we may not agree with that person person, you know, personally of something, we we may object to something they don't they do or don't do, it doesn't make a difference. We're going to cover that story. But we have to bring our experiences to the story. And that's what makes us uh, have the advantage in a newsroom because we are black because we understand what that person in the neighborhood may be going through, because we speak the language, because we share a culture, then we can bring all of that to that story that perhaps someone who is not black cannot bring to that story. But we're not, we're not biased. You know, we're, we're doing what everybody else does. We're being who we are and we're being professional. Can I say something? Real fast, Karen? Of course. Okay, so some, someone asked and, and talked about the whole angry black man, angry black woman comment. Let me tell you this. There is a stereotype, unfortunately, that we have as black people, not only as black journalists, because we continue to get stereotyped anytime we try to speak up. So this is not just being a journalist. This is just being a professional in general. Whenever we are a confident black male or black woman, we are stereotyped 
of being if we disagree with someone of another race, of being an angry black man or being an angry black woman. And so that's what I was talking about. I wasn't talking about that's who we are. But if they want to call me that, they can call me that because I'm going to still come with it with confidence. It's not cockiness. It's confidence as a black man. I want to piggyback on that and just um, say the word rebellious resonates with me. I, I founded a, a magazine called Rebellious, and I used that word because my boss told me I was being rebellious when I was in the mainstream newsroom. And the reason was that I had asked for too many weekends off in a row. That's what I got called rebellious for. And I feel like it also speaks to, like, we've been talking a lot about culture, about coverage, um, but I think we also, of course, the other part of that equation is newsroom culture, is how Black journalists get treated in newsrooms in general, and the culture of newsrooms that um, supports the status quo idea that you have to be straight and white and middle class in order to be objective, that that is the default position for viewing the world. And if you are not those things, then you are biased. So, I mean, it's both about culture and about, it's both about coverage and about newsroom culture and the culture of journalism as a whole. And, and Thank I'll, you. I'll jump in. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Say, just, you know, and also just the, the positioning of bias versus objectivity is false in and of itself, because the two are not, they're not polar opposites to each other. And, and I just straight up, I'm not objective. I have a viewpoint, I have a perspective. It just doesn't make its way into my news coverage. And it also, but it does guide my interests. It does guide the way I see the world. For instance, Walking While Black would not come to be had it not been for my lack of objectivity. So I'll give you the origin story. Uh, my colleague who was white, um, great reporter Ben Conart, he wrote a daily story about a viral video where a young black man had this encounter with the police. So it was a daily story. It wasn't going to be anything more than a daily story. He astutely, in that daily story, identified that the, the, the cop tried to give Devante a ticket for walking around, a ticket for not having his ID, which is illegal and you can't do, because guess what? They ain't been doing that for, oh, say, about 100 or so years, right? So I saw that video. My homeboy in Jacksonville wrote up a daily story. I watched the video. And as a black man, was offended by what I saw. I was offended that the officer tried to give my man, say, basically say, hey, can I see your walking papers, is what he tried to say to him on the street. And he was flanked by two other officers who did not bat an eye. So watching that, I was like, oh, that's real casual. They've done that before. And so then that's where I start to put on my skills hat. I say, you know, I know how to obtain the data to show that they've done that before. And that's where the journalistic pursuit begins. But it began in the beginning from my lack of objectivity and watching the video and seeing what was happening to the young man and recognizing that it was wrong, it was unjust. And as a journalist, I can ask educated questions that can lead to a story that could have profound impact on that issue. Yeah. Thank I, you. I, yeah. Go ahead. I, Go I ahead. totally agree with Topher. I totally agree with Topher because uh, I'm sorry, but. I grew up as a black man. And so uh, raised by a single black woman. And what I went through growing up, the trials and tribulations I went through growing up helped to mold me to the man I am today to help me tell some of these amazing stories. And so what happened with George Floyd, I'm sorry, I felt the pain. I cried, it hurt me. So when I'm on television that evening and they're burning down and, and we are protesting peacefully, some of us, some of us took to the streets and started fires and started rioting, I had to speak out against that. Now, I received some backlash, very few, but I also received a lot of support from our community for speaking out because at the same time, I didn't want it to take away from the message. So I believe that, you know, there is, there is a way based upon where we came from you can add perspective as a journalist. It's okay to add perspective, but you have to be careful on when you add that perspective. And you can be objective at the same time. And it, it adds humanity to who you are as a journalist. Like I said, yes, I'm a journalist, but at the same time, I'm also black. Juwan, I, I think we I, need to redefine this a little bit, don't you, Karen? I mean, because you know, the word bias, objectivity, you know, I, I, you know, I think this unfortunately probably needs a longer conversation because I think 
the, the so, same thing. You know, I mean, yeah. you are going I, I'm, to bring. I'm, and I'm using the language. Um, I'm using the language of bias very much from the research. Objectivity yeah. is something that is really being interrogated and litigated all over social media. What does that mean today in a world where news is infinite and immediate, constant? Um, um, th that's really a conversation going on at. NABJ, National Association of Black Journalist Conferences, at journalism conferences um, across the industry. So it's it's a really important issue that I, I really wanted to get at. Um, uh, we just, we have a few more minutes. Um, the chat is fire. There are just a, a ton of comments. Um, I can't even get to all of them. Um, um, but I, 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 I do want to let you know, I am going to ask you for final thoughts, like a quick final thought. So start thinking of that mic drop genius thing of all the things you could say. But um, I, I do want to get at a little bit. Um, it, look, the other thing that this research really shows is that white Americans and Republicans, that are, there is a partisan divide around um, diversity. And so I, I just want to get at that a little bit. How, how does that strike you for your work? This, this idea of bias, that those voices are le left out. Does anybody want to take a crack at that? Topher, do you think you can talk about that? I just want to make sure I understand the question. Could you repeat it, please? So uh, some of the research shows that there is another, uh, there is another group, Republicans and white audiences that are losing trust in journalism that think it's bias. So, what does that mean for journalism? What does that mean for the work? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, for me personally, I don't know that it means much um, because with each story that I do, I um, apply intense scrutiny to the story because again, given my position now that I am uh, given some latitude to kind of choose the projects I work on, I often work on things that I think has an import to the community and I want it to resonate. And so for me, it must, uh, you know, withstand the most intensive scrutiny in order for it to resonate. And so I don't know that, uh, you know, the trust that's being lost on some white readers, white viewers, and I don't know that it's going to impact or change the way I pursue my journalism because I've always pursued it in a manner that would, uh, I hope, end up with a result that's above reproach. So. Would you talk about the scrutiny that goes into producing and producing the journalism that you produce? Uh, what, what does it entail? Just so for, for the for the non-journalist audience listening. Uh, sure. So, um, I mean, uh, we just published, I don't know, maybe it was a 9,000 word story about NYPD's uh, uh, inability to consider civilian complaints and uh, in that story, uh, 9,000 words, we fact checked every single sentence. And so it means two and a half days of going through a sentence and, and arguing over the verb in that sentence and whether it's fair to the complainant and fair to the officer. And that's, that's what the fact checking process looks like uh, for me. And I think that's uh, that kind of level of uh, intense uh, intentionality is kind of built into the reporting as well. Thank you. It is not a casual, it is not a ca ca casual effort at all, is what you're saying. Um, okay, final thoughts. Um, I'm going to start with Jawan. Do you have a quick final thought? We just have a couple of minutes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just make it real fast. First of all, I just want to thank all of our panelists. I want to thank all those that tuned in for this conversation. Extremely important. I want to thank the panelists who joined us. Uh, Dorothy, it's always an honor to work with you. Topher, uh, Karen Hawkins, uh, you, you know, I, lo I love just hearing from Topher and Karen, just different minds. And Karen, thank you once again. I just want to encourage everyone to continue to be a voice uh, in your newsrooms. Uh, if you are not in a newsroom, be a voice out there for the community. Uh, you know, you you have the most powerful thing. Use it. If you don't feel like, hey, I can't I can't speak about it. Well, you can write about it. If you can't do that, then contact someone who can, who can be that voice for you. Remember, you have that power. Use it. Use your mind. Uh, we're all surrounded by different things that are happening in our, in our communities. It's important that we put pen and paper. Um, and lastly, as I always say, education is the key to success. If you believe, you will succeed. Thank you, Karen Hawkins. 
which one that was fabulous, Karen Hawkins. Yes, thank Quick you final again. thoughts from you. Absolutely, thank you again. This was an amazing conversation and I just would leave with people to support community and ethnic media, support your local journalists. There are more than 100 independent media outlets in Chicago alone. I'm sure there are dozens at wherever you live that you know nothing about. It's important to seek those out, to support them, vote with your wallet. I'm sure they're running membership drives like right now we all are. So if you believe in local journalism and you believe that you want it to survive, please support it however you can. Thank you, Karen. Topher Sanders, um, final thoughts. Yeah, Karen stole my outgoing message, but I love it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just echo it. Like, uh, please support local journalists. You know, um, it's, what, it's what Dorothy said earlier, complain and compliment. I love that, right? You, if you like something, say it. If something rubbed you the wrong way, say that as well. But you gotta subscribe to your local newspaper. You gotta watch your local newscast. You gotta do that because um, local journalism as much as uh, at ProPublica I do national stuff now, but it, 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 does not, it goes nowhere without local reporting. All of the stories I'm most interested in are about local issues. So, so please support your local reporters uh, is vitally important to our democracy. Thank you. And finally, Dorothy Tucker, president of the National Association of Black Journalists. Um, thank you. It was really a pleasure being here with all of you. I learned a lot. It was great engaging with all of you and hearing from all of you. Let me just say that uh, I know that uh, many journalists are really going through a very challenging time. I know it is difficult sometimes to find your voice, which is why the National Association of Black Journalists exists. We are here for you. So if there is something going on in your newsroom, please, you know, do not hesitate to call. Uh, you know, I'm at that point where I have no problems with making another phone call, helping you out, giving some advice. We have an entire board just really kind of standing by waiting to help you. You know, that's what we are here for. So we got your back. Thank you. Thank you to this amazing panel, to this, this really, truly engaged audience. Complain, compliment, pay for it. And yes, this is recorded. Bye-bye. Thank you.